please take a moment to review our code of conduct. We seek to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and presenters. While we absolutely encourage engagement in the chat, we ask that you please be mindful of your commentary, remain professional and on topic. Keep an eye on the chat. We'll be dropping links, checking for questions for our presenter to answer live. This session is recorded. It will be available to view on demand within 40, 24 to 48 hours. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenter. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, hey there, everyone. I'm glad to be My name is Anish Shah. I work at Weights and Biases, the AI developer platform for all of your deep learning machine learning needs. And I'm really excited to teach you all how to master MLOps with Weights and Biases and Microsoft's exciting V2 small language model. So today we're gonna to jump right in to a lot of different advancements within the lang large language model and language model space and talk about how small language models like V2 alongside weights and biases can help you elevate your business needs. So we're gonna get a little bit technical. So feel free to drop in the chat at any point if you have any questions or just wanna chatter a little bit about some of the exciting work that I'll be presenting here. So let's talk about the surprising power of small language models. Largely inspired by the great folks at Microsoft Research, specifically Mojan Java Harupi, who gave a great talk at NeurIPS. So first I wanted to mention that there's this interesting Moore's law of language model that's been arising in which we see that gradually the increase in the size of these models, AKA how many layers you may hear, has directly correlated to the efficacy of these models. So what I mean by that is, for the GPT-3 model, which was 170 billion parameters, we didn't have a fancy and interesting chat GPT-like explosion. It was a really powerful tool for those who could utilize it properly, but it wasn't until GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 touched our hands that we understood that these extremely large language models had the power we needed to use it for a variety of use cases. And all this came from simply these language models learning how to reason similarly to like a human would. And so there's one interesting question that comes from this. Can we take the power of these language models, which are able to write code, play tic-tac-toe, write a proof about in the infinite primes, uh, or even draw images, uh, can we take all that information and condense it down into a form that is usable in its smallest factor? AKA, what is the smallest language model that we can create that still has the behavior of these large language models? How can we get large language model intelligence without the bloat of the size? And the reason this is important is because the bloat of the size of these large language models also uh, causes an inability for average consumers to create these models or use these models themselves. Unfortunately, in this... Uh, GPU, uh, uh, this lack of GPU world we have right now, uh, it's kind of difficult for an average Joe Schmo like me to grab an A100 to just sit there and uh, answer questions for me. But what I can do is load a smaller model and use it for similar use cases too. So that's what Fee initially aimed to do. Uh, Fee one wants to answer the question of, can we take a specialized small language model aka a, a, a model that's specifically curated for one task and have it be as good as the bigger players, like the large language models, like the GPTs and Claude's of the world. And Fee1 did prove that. Fee1 proved that by using, curating a very specific cookbook of good data and interesting model architecture, you can create a specialized small language model that's really good for Python coding that's as effective, if not more effective, uh, than, the, than models that were trained on 100 times more data and 10 times larger. But then we had one to ask the question, can we generalize this intelligence? Can we take Fee's uh, capability that you only use a hundredth of the data at a tenth of the size and adapt that outside of coding and into the world of generalized reasoning. And that's what Fee 1.5 helped prove. 
It proved that we were able to maintain this efficacy in coding while still being more useful within tasks such as human reason or common sense reasoning for models up to 50 times larger. And with fee two, we want to take this and scale it even more. We want to say, can we increase the size just a little bit more and even and push this capability even further, putting us not just at ability where we can uh, compare to models that are 50 times larger, but at models that are 100 times larger, at the, model, the scale of these truly large language models that we use today. And can we put that in the hands of developers who can then use this model as the backbone for bigger and more interesting things? So let's just take a look right now. Uh, if we see over here, we can see that these, there's arrow markers here. The blue bar represents V2, while this giant dark green bar, I apologize for those who are colorblind. Uh, this is blue and green, though, so hopefully that will help uh, differentiate the two. Um, this dark green bar over here represents llama 70 billion. So we can see that there's a marginal difference between V2 and llama 270 billion in which Llama 270 billion works a slightly better uh, within the GSM uh, 8K um, benchmark. However, in the benchmark for MBPP, we can see that V2 significantly outperforms Llama 70 billion and even beats Mistral 7B, which is one of the more medium-sized large language models that are extremely effective and popular in this day and age. And we do that across the board for a lot of different tasks. V2 consistently is among the players uh, of, of really good reasoning for models that are three times as big and then 50 times as big. So this shows that V2, with the interesting techniques I'm going to show now, is as effective, if not more effective, than the other architectures that people are already building on now, proving that V2 is a great breeding ground for a lot of interesting other models that we can build on top of it. And for me, building on top of these models is a very significant thing that the open source community is really taking advantage of. And hopefully all of you will take advantage of soon. But let's actually look at it in a qualitative perspective. Let's throw away the quantitative LLM benchmarks and actually just look at the outputs themselves. So we're going to actually look at the outputs uh, similar to the Gemini release that happened a few months ago. So transparently, these are the specific questions that Gemini didn't do a very great on, but V2 blows out of the water. So in this specific question, a skier uh, slides down a frictionless scope of height eight, 40 meters and length 80 meters. What's the skier's speed at the bottom? Not only does V2 provide the proper answer, it actually takes the opportunity to decompose its thought process for us. It mentions all the formulas needed. It mentions the physical concepts that relates to the formulas, and then actually plugs in the values for you. And let's look at another question. So in this one, we actually provide the full equation alongside the plugged in numbers from a student for this specific physics question. And phi2 actually looks at the formula itself understands the intention of what this formula was, so the formula for potential energy, and mentions where the incorrect placement of the variables are for this formula. So we can see here that for mathematical reasoning, phi2 does a really good qualitative job. We can take a look here and see that. So how do we get to this point? How do we create small language models that are extremely effective at work at reasoning through mathematical concepts, common sense, and even maintain that coding capability I mentioned earlier with the earlier phi1 and phi1.5 models. So the first important thing, which is a bit obvious for anyone who works in the data realm, is you have high quality training data. So for a majority of these large language models that you hear about, there's this specific task or data set called the stack. It is three terabytes of permissive code data that's essentially all of the source code within GitHub. What we do then is we filter down and we pull all the Python files and we throw in a large language model. We sit back in our chair for about a month or so, letting our GPUs burn the money that we don't have. And then we get this large language model that's effective at answering this, these specific Pythonic questions. 
But the problem is, if we look at this data set, actually, oh, for the programmer types in the, in the audience, we can see that most of this is just setting variables. What we're doing is we're setting configurations for a specific class here. This isn't useful information for defining the logic of a Python program. It's simply setting variables or it's setting internal attributes. So what we need to do is we actually should be curating a small data set focused on textbook quality data, uh, textbook quality educational content. So we don't want information that is not useful in, in actually educating oneself. What we want to do is we want to learn a task better with a smaller model by using data that can actually help us learn. So what we can do for that is actually um, filter down all of the data that we have and label it into things such as high educational and low educational. What's really good at labeling this type of information? GBT4. Unfortunately, because of the size of data that's available, so 26, 26 billion tokens uh, of Python code is available within the stack, it's not very feasible for many organizations, especially research ones, to take the brunt of that $1 million cost that would accrue by using GPT-4 to do this classification for us. But we can do is use traditional machine learning techniques. We can use GPT-4 to label a small fraction that stays within budget, which is a very important constraint for all of us, and then take that label data as high educational and low educational and just train our own model for it. So we can train a very interpretable random force classifier to then take the label data from GPT-4 and have this model that's very effective at doing the remaining token to look at the remaining Python files and label it as highly educational or low education. And then afterwards, we can also take this information that is considered high, high, high educational value and then actually pass it into a cheaper model. So what we can say is, hey, we have all this data that we labeled as high educational value. What we can then do is use some of that information alongside a cheaper GPT 3.5 model and simply say, given that this is high educational content, construct more examples that are high educational. So we can then synthetically generate 1 billion extra tokens of extremely useful data that will be useful for small, small language models to actually learn how to effectively write logical code. And so one important thing is we got to make sure we inject creative randomness in the prompts that we use. So Tiny Stories is a, a very useful paper that kind of explains how to permute on these prompts to then get really um, creative but useful uh, coding type of content. And we can grab uh, all of this information of label data and set data and create textbooks. And then these textbooks are our training data for our small language model. So we can take all of this information and we can do is we can just pass it directly into our, our, our training. And so we can see here that um, uh, even if we use the full stack over here, we get up to after training for 135, 410, and then around 1090 GPU hours for the these for against the human eval data set, uh, which is a specific curated data set of programming questions and whether or not it would run effectively and have the correct response to certain tests. We see we get these scores of 11, 12, and 17% when we train, train directly on the baseline stack data set. But with our code textbook data set, the mixture of filtered high educational data from the stack, and then also our synthetically generated data, we get 16, 20, and 29% um, accuracy uh, for the same amount of GPU hours for our small language model. And so this is extremely useful information for us. This allows us to understand that by simply curating really good data, you get really good models. So I'm very happy to say that our intuition from traditional machine learning still holds true. Take the opportunity to properly curate your data. And then similarly, one step you can take further actually is we can actually align our models to be really good at 
uh, performing function complete and completion given natural language instruction. So in the world of large language models, what we do is we actually just throw a bunch of texts at these large language models. And then after the fact, we use almost like a version of fine tuning. So AKA the ability of imputing extra data on top of pre-trained models to give it additional behavior. And especially in the case of alignment, we want our models to act the way that we define for it. So in this case, because it's like a fee one style data set, what you want to do is we want our model to be given a prompt about writing code and actually write code uh, based on that prompt itself. So previously with these data sets, what it would do is you give it a section of un uh, unfinished code and it would finish it for you. By aligning it with a prompt, we can now say, hey, write me a function that will return a list of valid guessing letters, which are letters that have not been guessed yet and are present in the word. All we need to do now is present this to our model and then this code will be written for us. So this is another useful thing about curating high quality data sets is that by doing it with only 200 million tokens generated with GPT 3.5 and less than 1 million exercises, we're able to properly align our fee model to not only finish code for us, but to actually create original code given natural language. And so after all of this information, we're able to boost our numbers up from 16, 20, and 29% uh, from the fee base model, as we call it. And with fee one itself, we're able to pump 29% on human eval up to 51 by simply aligning. And to put this into perspective, if we look at this, at these like specialized models like Star Coder or even um, Code Llama, we're able to see we have extremely close results for the MBPP datasets for models that are significantly larger. So Fee One is 1.3 billion, and Code Llama is 34 billion, and we can see here there's only a differential around 0.7%. Similarly, at this 50.6, we can see that we beat essentially every other model on this list except for Wizard Coder and Code Llama and also GPT-4. But GPT-4 is a beast of its own. Uh, but we can see here that all these models are significantly larger. And if we do compare it to models of similar size, so something like this, um, yeah, like a 1.1 billion model, these models do significantly worse. Same with Repolit and the CodeGen models over here. And the second piece that's extremely useful in this is outside of just take using really high quality data sets, what we can actually do is do thing, do really interesting deep learning techniques. Uh, uh, and so what we can do is we can use techniques such as use interesting formulas from the Gopher, data, Gopher training formulas to round the amount of layers that we need for scaling from fee, fee one small, so the 350 million version, up to the um, 1.3 billion version. Similarly, what we can also do is we actually take the attention weights directly from the smaller models and initialize it with other random values to match the size of the layers at the attention layers that we want. And lastly, what we can also do is we can also, instead of randomly initialize, is actually tile the data that we're imputing from the smaller model to the bigger model to get the same ability to start to increase the efficacy of our bigger model based on the pre-trained pre weights of smaller models. That's all simply to say, by doing a mixture of high quality data and interesting techniques where we use pre-existing models alongside of interesting imputation techniques, we're able to take smaller models, use its learned capability, impute it into bigger models, and then use those, then find, then uh, continue training on those bigger models to get to a point where you have extremely powerful uh, reasoning capability from, 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 our, from the models that we're trying to iteratively increase the size of and iteratively increase the, amount, the quality of data for. AKA okay, when we go from fee one to fee 1.5 to fee two, we use every step of the previous model to help with the newer model. 
And this is an extremely effective technique that has uh, really great gains uh, in between each version of the model. Um, but, so we can simply say a good generalized SLM is achievable with textbook quality data and best practices for scaling up our model training itself. So that's a lot about model training itself and fee two. Let's actually talk about the process of improving LLMs and where MLOps can come into the picture. So to give a quick recap, pre-training is the idea of shoving a bunch of data at a model architecture and having all of that underlying capa underlying um, reasoning and data and all of the logic from that data set uh, appearing within that model architecture itself. Supervised fine tuning is when we actually align our model with the intention that we want from, from, the, from the model itself. So in that case, we want it to answer like a human would. And then, so that's a mixture of supervised fine tuning and RLHF. So using data that is specifically written in a human form to allow our large language model to not simply finish any statement provided to it, it's able to do things like answer questions. And so when we will fine tune things, um, when we actually fine tune our large language models, what we're actually doing is we're actually taking a, a pre-trained model and we want it to do a specific behavior. So that could be question answering, language generation, name entity recognition, sentiment analysis, summarization, and et cetera. And so in the world of large language models, this can appear in a couple ways. People may use RAG techniques to instead directly shove useful data into a prompt itself. People use prompt engineering to actually curate a specific string of words that is able to elicit a certain behavior from a large language model. But what we care about here and today is fine tuning, actually taking proprietary data and providing it to our language model so we're able to force it to have the behavior that we specifically want. And so in the case of fine tuning large language models, unfortunately, all of us don't randomly have a cluster of H100s around to actually reasonably do fine tuning on the whole model itself, which is what you traditionally do when you fine tune. You actually adjust all of the internal layers with this new data itself. But what we said is we use parameter efficient fine tuning, a specific collection of techniques that actually reduce the complexity of what we have to adjust in our large language model so we can reduce the amount of GPUs we need, the amount of data, and the amount of, of time altogether, so we, but still maintain that behavior of forcing the large language model to act a certain way based on the data we pass to it. One specific technique is called low rank adaptation. So the idea is that what we do is we actually select all the specific layers that we want to adjust and we treat it as a very interesting matrix decomposition problem and uh, the, the, the adjustment that we need to place on those specific layers. So what the adjustment is that when we pass data during fine tuning, we uh, pretty much change the internal numbers, aka the internal brain of the large language model itself. But with LoRa, what we're doing is we're actually providing a different collection of numbers that live elsewhere that say, whenever we're ready, we can instantly go into the brain of the model, change those numbers during runtime, so that prevents you from directly needing to train across all the data itself. We did, as we said, here are the specific segments of the brain that we only need to adjust when we need, to, when we actually need to run the task that's being asked of us. And that's actually a very useful technique that uh, tends to um, lead to the top models that you would see in most open source leaderboards. So let's actually look at an example of this. So here are some assets that are useful for the feed too. And I'll be sharing these later with along with the slide deck. But let's actually um, look at some examples of what we look for when we're fine tuning. So over here is what you see is a weights and biases dashboard. This dashboard allows us to analyze experiments at scale for any type of experiment that exists. So in this case, we're using it for large language models, but this can exist for anything across vision, audio, even protein modeling. 
So the charts we see over here represent the specific values that matter during our training. So over here, learning rate, LR, pretty much relates to how effective is our model, how, how much our model should we learn as we pass data to it. So we want to initially learn a lot, and then over time, learn a little bit less as time passes. And what's useful about this, all these charts, is that we're able to quickly at a glance understand when any large problems occur. So like in this case, there's actually no problems to specifically point out in this situation. But we can see here if we zoom in, eh, maybe not the eval loss. During training loss, we see this kind of like wavy line. So we can see here at the very top, there is this curve that occurs. It's It kind of has this um, bowl shape initially before becoming more of a cup shape. So here is this L shape that we want is extremely, is, is, is what we're looking for whenever we're training models. This means that our model is appropriately converging in its learning process. If at any point we see spikes in our learning, that means that there are problems in the learning process of our model, and it may require us to actually kill the experiment itself and investigate why these spikes may be occurring. But we don't see that in this specific situation. And we do see some initial bowl shape in the beginning, which is can be problematic. But we can see that eventually it does converge. So this is a bit hard to see on itself. So let's actually smooth this down to see if generally that shape I'm mentioning uh, comes through. So after smoothing it, we can see we have a better understanding of the shape here. If I actually zoom in let's, a little bit, we can see that, oh, maybe zoomed in a bit too much here. Let's zoom out, maybe grab this amount. So we can see here that there's this initial rise in loss, which is what we don't want to see initially. But we can see over time, this loss does eventually reach an asymptote before decreasing. And this decrease is what we want to see generally during our training process. So investigating when these bumps occur is extremely important for us in the, in the world of fine tuning or training these, these models. But more than that, this is so, sorry, one thing I forgot to explain is this is fine tuning a large model called Apaka on a specific data set, uh, sorry, uh, a review, uh, fine tuning the Llama 70 billion model with the Alpaca data set, which is training the Llama model to speak like a human. I only show this to show you the comparison of how the, the techniques and investigation for large language models is identical between large language models and small language models. And within weights and biases also, you're able to use tooling such as our tables like this to actually understand the pro input prompts that went in during the training of our data sets and the responses by our model uh, as they train. So for instance, we're told, um, create a weather update for the following city, this one being Madison, Wisconsin. And we can see here the response says the current temperature is in Madison is 82 degrees Fahrenheit and it's mostly sunny. But then it also has this weird follow-up where it says it again. So those are some things that we can directly investigate during the training process of our model. So this shows all the models at once. And I'll jump into workspaces where we actually dive in deep to individual models. Um, so let's jump into actually fine tuning fee two, which is the main course that we're here for. So we want in this specific situation, what we're trying to do is improve fee two for NLI using Hella Swag, AKA a lot of acronyms. So let's actually break that up. So NLI stands for natural language inference. So essentially what we're doing is um, we use a specific model and a technique called adversarial filtering to carry a data set that says, given a scene or a situation, what is the most logical response to this situation? So what I mean by that is that what we want to do is we want to ensure that our model is able to understand the intention of what's going on by the text. So we know that a woman is outside with a bucket and dog, and the dog is running around trying to avoid a bath. So these are all the possible ending situations to this scenario. 
So in this kinetic situation, we know that the dog gets wet. Sorry, get the she gets the dog wet, then it runs away. That's the specific situation that occurred within this specific uh, data set that we curate. Um, the rest of these um, don't actually can make sense in this specific scenario, but it does not actually respond to what's happening in this situation. So um, that is natural language inference. The idea that given a, a snippet of a situation and a collection of possible endings for that situation, what is the most appropriate ending? So it could also be known as recognizing textual entailment. Um, and, and so a lot of times this can be this ability of comparing a segment text or situation text alongside each of the possible ending scenarios. Um, it can usually fall into entailment, contradiction, or neutral. In this specific situation, we all we want to do is have our model just select the best option given four different possible endings for a scenario. So what we want to do essentially is use V2 alongside this data set where we're given context and a specific end a situation modifier. So in this case, sugar, and we want to actually have it signify the, the, the realistic ending. And what we do is we actually use the hella swag data set for this. So I hate saying that name outside. It's a very strange data set name, but it actually stands for, um, Oh, sorry, I'm going to take a section to actually pull up my notes so we can all read it here. Uh, it actually stands for, oh, I can't pull up my notes here. Ah, where is it? Harder endings, longer context, and low shot activities for situations with adversarial generations. I'll be sharing this deck later and you can have access to what, to what this specifically means. But in essence, what it essentially means is exactly what I said out loud. It is, here's a scenario with specifically hard endings, which one is the most appropriate scenario uh, ending for these specifically hard scenarios? So over here, we can see how we have Elmo models and BERT models that we're actually using this, this swag data set as a diagnostic. And so what's really useful for us is we want to use V2, a causal model, on a classification data set. And so what we do uh, from a very practical perspective is for each of the possible choices for our input, in, uh, input situation prompt, we what we do is we we provide fee to the prompt itself, the, sorry, the situation, and a choice, and it returns a score for us. So whatever is that lowest score or loss value returned from our fee model is the most correct answer. So that's how we're going to be treating the situation. Fee two is going to be given each of the specific situation with the imputed ending, and then the one with the lowest score is the best response. So let's actually look at, uh, let's actually understand what that process looks like for us and look at some code itself. So what we do is from a weights and biases perspective, um, what we do is we set up weights and biases by a very minimal amount of code. WANDB init simply says, hey, connect to our dashboard. So at any point you can log uh, text, numbers, models, tables, data sets, et cetera, uh, by simply saying want to be log or want to be log artifact. Then in real time, we're able to analyze all this information and pinpoint any issues in our training. So similarly, and I alluded to in that dashboard before, we can see weird spikes in our data sets, or we can see weird generations that come from our large language model that don't really make sense in context of what we're fine tuning for. And afterwards, we're gonna show this interesting piece of collaboration. So in the traditional world of machine learning, for those who are extremely pain tolerant, what you might do is just print these values traditionally in standard out. You might put an Excel or you might use TensorBoard. But the problem is that when you scale out all of these experiments, AKA when you run not just one bespoke experiment on a random Jupyter notebook or CoLab notebook, what you may want to do is actually run this across a paralyzed cluster running eight to 100 to 200 experiments all at the same time. And so during this situation, you need to make sure that you're able to easily centralize all this information 
and then also be able to do comparative analysis, like I showed earlier, where you're able to easily pinpoint one specific experiment and say, oh, this experiment's the one that's doing the best. Let's drill in deeper and maybe see why. And slice and dice across configurations to get to that point where we can do that pinpointing and selection. Um, so again, that's in a few lines of code. Um, and then so one things I find extremely useful is making sure that if you build this type of, of capability, you're doing it in minimal code, you're monitoring things like CPU and GPU usage, and you want to actually quickly find and reproduce from any point of your training because hardware failure is a very real thing. And these model usages can be, the, this model training can quickly get expensive. And for those of you who don't want to use our core primitives, we have really great integrations with tools like PyTorch Lightning or Hugging Face, where today we'll actually be looking at Hugging Face directly. Um, and so I'll pass the slide deck later, but there's a lot of tools that exist to really make a lot of this process extremely easily. And we'll walk through that in a more practical perspective. And if at any point you want to dive deeper, we have a lot of free courses to allow you to do this. So let's actually just look at some experiments now. So I'm going to go and jump into some code. Uh, this is fine. Automax saving failed. Let's see. Size looks good. Let me know if the size is too small. I can zoom in even further. So at the very top, what we're doing is we're importing some really useful packages. So bits and bytes is used for quantization, making models smaller so it can fit properly in our GPU. Um, then what we can do is we have PEFT, which is our parameter efficient fine tuning library, which plugs directly into Hugging Face or, well, sorry, Transformers by Hugging Face. And um, yeah, I would say those are the most important imports. All this other stuff is just useful for like efficiency sake and loading and data sets and whatnot. And also the most important one, weights and biases. Uh, so over here, um, after logging into weights and biases itself and ensuring we're running on GPU, we import some in important aspects for fine tuning. We import the capability to fine tune our model and we also import the configurations needed to actually go ahead and do our parameter efficient fine tuning, specifically within the case of quantizing our specific, specific um, LoRa configuration in this case, that low rank adaptation. So we have our A100 loaded up here, where we can see that's actually currently um, running. And so, what we can see here is what we're doing is we're actually loading our model into 4-bit um, and we're actually converting all the 16 bits into the 4-bit. Then what we're actually doing is we're loading our model here where our model is the Microsoft V2 model um, that lives on the Hugging Face Hub very generously um, uploaded by the Microsoft research team. So after preparing our model for that 4-bit training that we defined in our bits and byte configuration, we now have this quantized model available for LoRa fine tuning. Afterwards, what we do is we ensure we just find all the appropriate places to do our LoRa fine tuning on. AKA, what this means is we're actually, a, what I mentioned with LoRa earlier is we're selecting the specific layers in our large language model that we actually want to adjust. So we're actually pinpointing, hey, these are the models that require those weight updates that we want to actually fine tune on and do that separately from the model itself. So that's what this helps us do. We then lo load our Hello Swag dataset very easily from Hugging Face datasets, and we do some pre-processing here. Um, we actually grab this pre-processing directly from the LLM evaluation harness, a very useful tool that is uh, able to easily allow you to um, run evaluation across a collection of, yeah, around a, around a collection of tasks that are useful in understanding how effective your model is for a certain variety of use cases. Um, and so, in this case, this pre-processing we're doing is in essence uh, similar to the prompt engineering. We're formatting our data set to be in a form that we're going to be using as the base prompt that signifies to our model, oh, I am on the situation in which we fine-tuned on. 
So we use like specific signifiers of the, this text will now be the specific signifiers that we're at the situation where we are answering this NLI problem, where we're actually taking the opportunity to understand is this specific um, situation with the ending appropriate and then passing out that score. So after uh, doing that pre-processing here, what we do is we actually actually go ahead and upload our data set to weights and biases. So this is useful here because at any point we can go ahead and rerun our data set. So hopefully, actually, yes, sorry. Let me see something really quick. Our model is, so our model is continuously training. I'm gonna do something and just actually kill this. Come on. Cool, our model is killed. Someone asked in the chat, let's look at the data set. Let's, let's look at it. Um, maybe mini, mini val ts. Oh, sorry, dot, oh. data. I think that's how we can just look at the raw data set. So in this situation, um, what we did is we actually did a conversion already. So what we did is if we go back to the pre-processing script earlier, what we did is we um, grabbed the activity label. So we actually took that situation. And for each of the situations, we grabbed all of the endings. So we can see here that the document that we label says, hey, here is the situation in text. Here are the four available choices also in a list of text where gold is the label for each of the specific documents themselves. So which one of these out of the four choices, which index is the most, is the correct answer. And then for each of the, um, for yeah, for each of the so for, sorry, and the text here is that true answer in its full full form. After we convert each of the documents into this form, when we pass this over to our pre-processed data set, what we're actually doing is we're just taking in that specific text answer itself, and we're throwing it into this pre-processing function which uses the tokenizer here. So what a tokenizer does is it converts it into a form that's actually readable by our large language model. So in this case, this simply maps internally to like the language code book that our model understands. And the attention mask simply signifies whether or not our model should be looking to that word as useful during its training process. So. I do apologize. It's not really human readable as I'd like it to be. Uh, should have definitely had it in that step. So thank you, Akalpak, for mentioning that. But in essence, the specific text that's being passed to our model is the, is the, the situation with the ground truth ending. Uh, that, that, that's it. So that's what our fine-tuned model is looking at. It's just looking at a sentence where that sentence is a situation with a true answer. Where the chant and the for where it does not look at the false answers in this specific situation. Uh, there is the capability to throw in like the negative responses, but um, we didn't do that in this specific situation. Uh, so good, great question. Uh, but so now that we have our data set prepped and it's readable in the form that the large language model wants, we then define a bunch of different arguments to just to define things such as how we want to optimize it, what type of scheduler is it using? So what type of learning rate does it have? And then also it has this report to one DB flag where for every eval step and every, um, every epoch and every save step, all of the information of learning from our model is streamed to a weights and biases dashboard. So what we do is we run this for a bunch of different parameters. What we do is we use the 32 alpha, 0 0.1 dropout, and we just try the two different R values, 8 and 16. 
These three values are extremely important in the world of low rank adaptation fine tuning. We can see here, we use this artifact to actually load in our data set. So at any point, we're actually able to pinpoint which data set relates to a specific fine tune model. So in fact, I can actually jump into here, the specific workspace itself, CICD 1DB, and we can see the different experiments that we are running. So we can see the upload data set here. So if I were to click into this, I can actually see the three different data sets that I uploaded. And if I want to, I can actually do a situation where I say, hey, for this mini, mini validation data set, what are all the models I trained? And this is really useful in the case of uh, for in the case of wanting to understand if there's any specific issues with compliance or governance with the data sets that you're using. So I can actually say here, for my mini validation data set, here are all the different models that actually touch this data set. I'm actually also able to see all the checkpoints that came from this model. So I can see for this for this Laura Alpha 32 data training, I can dive into this specifically, click this run path. Okay, this is the one that actually crashed earlier. So I do apologize for that. Artifacts, lineage. Let's look at this one, this one here, this one finished, we can see, we can jump into here. And so we actually investigate this model at an individual level. We can see all the gradients of our model itself for each of the layers. We can see all the parameters we use and the adjustment of those values as we train. So like the underlying weights from our LoRa configuration and how they change over time. We can also see, we wanna make sure we have this elbow curve from our loss to ensure that our model is converging properly. And then for our training, we can also see um, similarly, is our loss working properly? And we can actually see here, if I were to just smooth this out a little bit, this model's actually having a little bit of a problem. We can see that if I were to continue training after this, this bell, this, yeah, this bell shape into this cup shape, it's actually starting to re-rise back up. So we're able, actually seeing that it's now reaching the bottom of the cup shape and actually increasing in loss, which means that there might be a problem with not only the learning rate, but maybe some of the other configurations that we want to analyze. So we actually dive in and actually see all the different configurations that we use here, where the one I want to look at is which LoRa one was I using. So you can see here, LoRa Alpha 32, Dropout 1, and LoRa R equals 16. So this is, this is actually, uh, this is useful for us to now pinpoint data sets to models, to model checkpoints or any saved final models alongside the configurations. And most importantly for me, system utilization. So I want to also see, am I properly using the GPU resources available to me? So like in this case, we actually, we're actually doing a very poor job of fully utilizing our A100 available to us. We're actually only capping around around 61% over here, where we want to actually see us capping around around 90% at minimum for me to be comfortable on saying that we're fully utilizing this resource available to us. In this case, we can see that these drops actually come from the situation where we actually run evaluation because we actually need less compute during this time. And actually, could I could actually spend some opportunity to probably optimize um, how well my evaluation also util utilizes um, our GPU resources. So um, that's actually how to use weights and biases alongside an individual dashboard to understand our modeling. If we actually jump back out here, we actually do a comparative analysis and maybe see what the best model may be for our use case itself. So what we can do is we can go in this loss chart over here, look for the model that has, actually they're all training very similarly because we only made small adjustments to the lower configuration. So in this case, maybe I'll look at where around step 50 maybe. So let's jump back to step 50. And we can see that the LoRa Alpha 32 dropout 0.1 R8 is the best model in the situation. So I may want to iterate on that specific model itself by adjusting more configurations. We can also test out different things such as use 
um, um, different types of schedulers. So instead of using the linear one I mentioned earlier, we try cosine, cosine with restarts, or reduce LR on, on plateau. So to pull out a different workspace, we can see that in this specific situation where if I want to, I can actually maybe adjust, filter out those with name in scheduler. So in these three values, for instance, so only look at the schedulers that have changed. And we, we can see if we jump down into our training, go back over here and go back to loss, these are all not converging properly at all. They're actually all increasing over time in a negative way. So um, if we go back here and jump all the way down to validation, what we're actually doing when we want to run evaluation for our specific model, what we're actually doing is simply going back to our raw data set itself. And we're just saying for each of the choices that are available, simply concatenate it with the um, original query, pass it into our human, our LM readable form, and whatever has the lowest score from our model, oops, sorry, whatever has the lowest score from our model is the best answer. And so we see after fine tuning, oh no, I did not print this out properly. Ah, sorry, let's go back to here. Jump back into this collab here, the baseline one. And I'll also mention that this will all be shared later. We reach as normalized accuracy around 63%. So that's how we can use weights and biases with a mixture of tools to understand which specific models are the best, uh, to understand which models are the best, and then take that model and run it for validation. Then if we want to reach a form where you want to uh, automate our model training process, we had to use a specific collection of tools that is different from the traditional software stack, where we have tools such as uh, Circle CI or GitHub Actions that will simply take code changes, run it against a pre-scripted collection of tests that only look at the code itself and its impact on pre-written test cases before deploying it to production. In the world of ML, this process is a lot more complicated. What you're actually doing is you're not looking at only changes of code, but you're actually looking at changes in data and model architecture, as we saw earlier. So how we're changing the configuration of the model and maybe even changing the data set itself by versioning it. So when you look at the outputs from these different changes, you want to not only look at the output in terms of, of what the results of that model are, but you actually want to ensure that you orchestrate this modeling process appropriately, AKA look at the model and data itself choose the right GPU cluster, have that GPU cluster assigned to that modeling task. And at the end of that modeling task, put it into a review cycle where we compare it to a bunch of different models within that dashboard and then check off uh, on say, this model is definitively the best model given data configuration and architecture. So we cannot simply say that traditional CICD is the same as traditional GitOps. And so that's a big problem that we see here today is that we see a lot of people use traditional tools like CircleCI and GitHub Actions to do everything. But that tends to break workflows quite easily. It actually causes you to have problems where you're pushing models directly into production without having all the appropriate checks that are specific to ML. So let's actually posit a situation. Let's say that someone asked the question, hey, I changed some different configurations in comparison to the current model that we have in production. So let's actually, we'll go ahead and understand um, which model is the best. So what we might have is someone say, do the new, feed, new parameters make a difference? And someone answers very, what hurts my heart? Yes, I think so. In the world where administration and governance around AI is extremely um, important, where it becomes essential to be able to pinpoint and say with, with definitive precision, yes, because, um, yes, I think so, just doesn't cut it anymore. So 
there's this world where we not look at code, review code and experiment results, push models in a situation where we can do this comparison and say that any changes we make to configurations live in a way where we can compare it against all the other candidates for models and then push that model into production. With current workflows, like the one I showed in that picture earlier, those people would go ahead and just simply look at the code experiment results and then naively push models directly into production without having this comparative analysis. And so behind the scenes, that's where those changes to data configurations and changes to those ad and those ad hoc experiments would actually have that would actually those problems that would arise for ML modeling, it, those would not be found in that previous workflow that I showed in that slide. So instead what we want to do is we actually want to live in a world where if someone asks that question, hey, compare it to a new model, all one of my ML engineers need to do is simply say slash one DB or slash compare, and they'll be able to compare it, they pull up that specific experiment itself. And that specific experiment is what will go ahead and um, and be able to say, hey, the model in current production, here's the one you just asked about, and here's that comparison. So if, we're actually, if we actually dive into the code itself, we're able to go in and see that it's actually a very simple GitHub action itself. So if we go in, it's, oh, let me zoom in, pip install the GitHub action API in WandDB. Look for a PR comment that just says slash WandDB. Grab the run ID is in this specific situation, but you have more complicated logic. And then run compare runs. And what compare runs will do is it will actually go ahead and grab that specific project that you want to run comparison on and build what we call a weights and biases report. And in that case, and what that is in, in the, from just a, from a visual perspective is it's this. If I had to click into this report here, what it does is we actually can able to look at the baseline run, which is called lower alpha 16 dropout 0.1 R8 and pull the other model that we want to compare. So schedule or reduce LR and plateau and return all the results about this. And so this is actually extremely powerful in understanding um, how well a model compares to another baseline model by using the tools that are familiar to us. In this case, a collection of PRs and also a collection of GitHub action tooling. So that's just to say that using GitHub Actions alongside your experiment tracking tool, you can create workflows that are extremely effective in comparing information that are ML specific and make spot decisions looking at experimental results in whether a model is appropriate into production, which is what we just did with that specific PR comment. So the GitHub repo will be shared in this uh, in this um, specific slide deck that will be shared to you later. Uh, and if at any point you want to learn more, you can go to Enterprise Model Management, which is our, uh, one of our free courses, or visit our in-person fully connected conference, uh, which is at wandb.me slash fully connected underscore SF, and learn more about the interesting tooling around large language models and experiment tracking that we have. Uh, so feel free to stay in touch if you have any other questions and want to DM me privately or come to our open Discord or also just learn more at our courses. Uh, thank you all. And hopefully you're able to learn more about fee two, large language models, small language models, and how to use experiment tracking alongside MLOps tooling to build workflows that are effective for choosing the best models to push into production. Thank you.